Here we go. Welcome to the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'm so beyond honored to welcome Dr. Dean Ornish. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm happy and honored to be on your show. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, today, we wanted to really talk not only about you, but you do have a new book, and I'll show it here. We'll put a link here, the Undo It book uh, by you and your, your lovely wife. And But before we dive into Undo It, which is phenomenal because I think it incorporates so many things that we ignore in medicine as physicians that we need to be speaking to our, our patients about. But can you give us a little background uh, briefly of how you even discovered the value of you know lifestyle modifications outside of even nutrition? But what is your own personal uh, journey? Sure. Well, let's see. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, when I was a second year uh, medical student, I was learning how to do bypass surgery. And, you know, we cut people open, we bypass their clogged arteries. The doctor would tell them they were cured. And more often than not, they'd go home and do all the things that had caused the problem in the first place, you know, eat junk food and smoke and not manage stress, not exercise. And often their new bypass arteries would clog up and we'd have to cut them open again, sometimes multiple times. So for me, bypass surgery became a metaphor of an incomplete approach that we're literally bypassing the problem. We weren't treating the cause. And so one of the nice things about being a medical student is you'll try things you wouldn't do if you, if you had already been indoctrinated and, quote, knew better. So I took a year off between my second and third years of medical school to begin the first study. This was back in 1977, 78, over 40 years ago. Uh, and we showed that heart disease could be reversed. And uh, it was the first time that had been shown. It was really thought impossible to do anything other than slow down the rate at which it got worse. So the fact we could actually reverse it was, uh, was revolutionary. And it also taught me that when you're doing something that's really disruptive, it's not always met initially with uh, great acceptance. You know, it's very threatening. And so people say, well, you know, how do you know they wouldn't have gotten better anyway? And I said, well, how many patients have yours, you know, that their angina went away by, you know, 91%, you know, we showed improved blood flow to the heart, the ability of the heart to pump blood improved. And uh, people who literally couldn't walk across the street without getting severe pain or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work without getting severe angina or chest pain within a few weeks, we're able to do all those things. I said, well, yeah, we didn't have a randomized control group, but how likely, how, how often do you see this? And so it was really held to a different standard. So, but it got me interested in doing this and it became my life's work. And so we did a, uh, subsequent studies that did have randomized control groups. So we were able to replicate that and show that even the severely clogged arteries became measurably less clogged and over even more reversal after five years than after one year. And so we helped create a new field called lifestyle medicine, which is using lifestyle changes, not only to help prevent disease, but actually to treat it and often even reverse it. Sometimes in combination with drugs and surgery, often as a direct alternative to these. And you know, the more diseases we study and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why these simple changes are so powerful and how quickly people can get better. So we found that heart disease could be reversed, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity. And you know, Laurie, when people get put on these medications to lower their blood sugar, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What, what, what do we usually tell them? You know, forever, right? It's like, I've been showing this cartoon for literally decades of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing and no one's turning off the faucet. It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like forever. Well, why don't we just treat the cause, turn off the faucet? And to a much larger degree than we had once realized, the cause are the lifestyle choices that we make each day what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise, how much love and support we get. And the more diseases we look at and the more underlying biological mechanisms we study, the more reasons we have to explain why these simple changes are so powerful and how quickly can, people can get better. So we went on to show that early stage prostate cancer, we did the first, and as far as I know, the only randomized trial showing that the progression of early stage prostate cancer can be slowed, stopped, and often even reversed by making these same lifestyle changes. That uh, if it's true for prostate cancer, there's a good chance it'll be true for breast cancer as well. We did a study with uh, Craig Venter, who first decoded the human genome and published it showing that when you change your lifestyle, it changes your genes. Over 500 genes in three months, turning on the genes that keep us healthy, turning off the ones that cause us to get sick. We did a study with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work with telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that regulate how long we live. And we found for the first time that we could actually lengthen telomeres. And when we published this in the International Medical Journal, The Lancet, uh, they called it uh, reversing aging at a cellular level. And we're now directing the first randomized trial to see if these same lifestyle changes can reverse the progression of men and women who have early to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And so one of the 
the, the radical unifying theory that uh, we're presenting in our new book and undo it is the idea that although you know you and I and all doctors were trained to view heart disease as a very different disease than diabetes or prostate cancer or Alzheimer's, whatever, that they're really not, that they're really the same disease manifesting and masquerading in different forms because they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome and telomeres and gene expression and angiogenesis and so on. And each one of these mechanisms is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. And it's one of the reasons why patients often have several of these diseases at the same time. You know, they'll have high blood pressure and high cholesterol and be overweight and have heart disease and so on. And it also explains why, you know, with all this talk about personalized medicine and the 40 years of doing studies, it wasn't like there was one set of diet and lifestyle recommendations for reversing heart disease, a different one for diabetes or prostate cancer or whatever. It was the same for all of these because again, they're all the same disease, just masquerading and manifesting in different ways. And so in our new book, uh, Undo It, my wife Ann and I wanted to make it radically simple. And it begins with a quote from one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein that says, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it well enough. And because we've been doing this for our, mostly my whole adult life, um, I understand it really well. And so we want to just radically simplify it down to eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And everything else is really just commentary on that. I don't think you can get much more simple than that. But I, I really like the point that you discussed, you know, where people try to um, silo certain chronic diseases. And that's how we were. I'm a primary care. I'm a family medicine physician. Also, we're certified lifestyle medicine. I took the first board uh, test. That was very exciting. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I felt what an honor to be a part of that. And, um, but the, the thing here is that, you know, as family medicine, we're getting so much complicated um, chronic disease patients that we do send them to the endocrinologist and to the pulmonologist and to the cardiologist, but nobody takes the time because we don't have much time either. We're checking off the list. Okay. I've met these criteria, these guidelines, but nobody gets better. And we don't discuss like you said, the, the love of relationships, the stress. And when we do, patients are so astounded and surprised and delighted, actually, that someone would take the time to take interest in their overall health. And I think it's so very important. And I, I do like the book, how it, you break down even the science in each part that you had just discussed. Um, and I think it's very easy to understand even those without a scientific background. So I do really appreciate that. However, I, I did have a question. Um, when you, uh, back in the beginning, because you said you were in medical school, what was the nidus though? What was the one thing because it did just pop in your head or what, like, what, was, the, what was the little sprout? Because I know how I discovered lifestyle medicine. But what was it for you? What was it, that thing that led you into this amazing research career? Well, it was, I guess, on two levels. One is I was suicidally depressed when I was in college. And I found that these lifestyle changes really transformed my own life. And so when I got to medical school and I saw that we weren't really addressing the cause of the problem, we were literally and figuratively bypassing it. And if you don't treat the cause, then the same problem often comes back again. The bypasses clog up or angioplasties restenose. Or if you take medication, you have to take it for the rest of your life with all the attendant side effects and often in ever-increasing dosages. So I went to these things called, back then they called them libraries. They had these things called books and journals that most people don't even see anymore because everything's online. And... Um, I started reading voraciously and I realized that in dogs and cats and pigs and rabbits and monkeys, you could cause them to get heart disease if you fed them unhealthy, high fat, high sugar foods. If you put them under emotional stress, you can make them even smoke cigarettes uh, if you disrupted their social networks, but you could reverse it if you change them. So why should people be any different? We said, people, oh no, it's impossible. I said, well, we're not that different from all these other animals. And if every animal we looked at, why should people be any different? It was really kind of an interesting lesson for me how we tend to get stuck in our worldviews and they color our thinking and they filter out so, many, so much information that if we didn't bring those preconceptions there, we could see it with, uh, with beginner's mind uh, or fresh eyes or without those preconceptions. And so that's, and again, I think because I was only a second year medical student, I hadn't been fully indoctrinated. So it gave me the chance to see with, with fresher eyes than people who had already been through the system had. And wow. you know, we called the book Undo It because my favorite key on the computer has always been the undo button. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had something in our own lives? And, and now we do. But also the spiritual teacher that I studied with uh, when I was suicidally depressed was a 
an ecumenical teacher named Swami Satchidananda. And people say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo. You know? So <laughs> you know, it's kind of an homage to that as well. But, right. you know, but part of the book is really not just about unclogging arteries or you know, lowering your blood sugar, as important as those things are. Because what I learned when I was ready to do myself in was that we have to deal with issues that we're really not trained in medical school, like love and community and, and meaning and purpose and so on. Uh, you know, if you, the real epidemic in our culture isn't just heart disease or diabetes or, or cancer, it's loneliness and depression. You know, more, more prescriptions are written for antidepressants than just about anything else. And it's because of the disruption of the social networks that used to give people a sense of love and connection and community. You know, 50 years ago, most people had an extended family they'd see regularly. They had a neighborhood with two or three generations of people that they grew up together. They had a job that felt secure that they'd been, you know, they got, you really got to know your coworkers. They had a, a church or a synagogue or a club. People spent time with their friends. And today, many people don't have any of those. And what, this, what the science teaches us is that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from virtually all causes when compared to those who have a strong sense of love and connection and community. And I don't know anything in medicine that has that big an impact, even smoking. And in fact, a lot of these behaviors are a direct way of people coping with their pain, just like when I was in so much pain when I was in college. I mean, telling somebody who's lonely and depressed that they're going to live longer if they just change their lifestyle isn't, doesn't work. They're, they're just trying to make it through the day. I mean, if, I didn't even know if I wanted to live at all. A lot of people feel that way. And I was able to take all the meaning out of life. You know, who cares? So what? Nothing matters. Big deal. Why bother? You know, all that kind of nihilism, which is so pervasive. And, 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 you know, I think the opioid epidemic that people are struggling with now and the sense of, uh, of, of you know, I've had patients say things like I've got 20 friends in this, sorry, let me turn my phone off here. Uh, I've got 20 friends in this package of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends? What are you going to give me? Mm-hmm. Or food fills that void or alcohol numbs the pain or opioids numb the pain or video games numb the pain or too much, uh, uh, you know, working all the time is a more socially acceptable way of distracting yourself from that pain. And so for me, the pain is the messenger saying, hey, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And so, you know, giving people information is important, but, you know, we're drowning in information with Google and so on. It's not like people who smoke don't know it's bad for them. It's on every pack of cigarettes. So, you know, we have to work at a deeper level beyond the information, beyond the the behavior to say, why are we doing these things? And so if we can address the underlying loneliness and depression and help people use these techniques of meditation and yoga and so on, not just to manage stress better, but to quiet down our mind and body enough to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being and to realize that's our natural state. You know, everything in our culture, especially the whole advertising industry, teaches us that we get our health, we get our peace of mind, we get our self-worth and our self-love from outside ourselves. If only I could get more whatever, more money, more power, more beauty, more accomplishment is what we often fill in the blanks with, then I'd be happy, then I wouldn't feel so stressed, then I'd love myself and feel good about myself. And once you set up that view of the world, however, it turns out you generally feel bad because until you get it, you feel bad. If someone else gets it, then you feel really bad and it makes you feel like we live in this very doggy dog, zero sum game world, the more you get the lessers from me and all that. And even if you get it, it's very seductive in the moment because it's like, ah, I got it, I'm happy, but it doesn't last. It's usually followed by either now what, it's never enough, or so what, big deal. And say, well, that didn't do it, maybe this will. And so part of the value of suffering and disease, which you and I were not really trained in medical school to deal with, is there's an openness to change. Because when you're in pain, the idea is like, okay, this stuff might be kind of weird, but boy, I'm hurting so bad, let me try this weird stuff. And because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic, when you make these lifestyle changes we've been talking about, most people feel so much better so quickly, their angina goes away, they, their brain gets more blood, they think more clearly, they have more energy, they need less sleep. You can actually grow so many new brain neurons, your hippocampus gets bigger, part of your brain gets bigger, the part that controls memory, which is often the first thing to go as you get older. Mm-hmm. Your skin gets more blood, you look younger, your heart gets more blood, your sexual organs get more blood in the same way that Viagra works. And so for many people, these are choices worth making. And you start to connect the dots between what you do and how you feel. It's like, oh, when I eat this way, when I manage stress, when I exercise, when I love more, I feel good. My pain goes away. When I don't, it comes back. So let me do more of this and less of that. And then it comes out of your own experience, not because some book or doctor or whatever told you. You can actually literally connect the dots between what you do and how you feel. And I've also gotten in the habit of asking people, 
why do you want to live longer? Which is not a question, again, that you and I were taught to ask in, in our medical training. Um, and because, again, telling somebody who's lonely and depressed that they're going to live longer, they're not sure they want to live longer. And so there's an inherent assumption that everybody wants to live longer. And if you're in a lot of pain, a lot of people don't. But if you can get people, so I ask people that, and they'll say, gosh, yeah, no one's ever asked me that before. Sure, no doctor's ever asked me that before. Let me think about that. Hmm. I want to watch my kids grow up. I want to dance at their wedding. I want to write a book. I want to make love with my partner. I want to, whatever it is that brings meaning and joy and pleasure into your life. That's what makes it sustainable. And then you're much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. Right. Absolutely. And I, it's funny because I, um, once I discovered the whole food plant-based diet by accident, literally with a patient about seven years ago, um, when I started speaking to patients, that was exactly it was hope. Right. And I think giving, providing hope of a different outcome than the one that they were prescribed literally by medications or physicians. And that's what was intriguing to people. And that's why people would stick with the lifestyle changes that we started incorporating. And then they started moving more, the relationships improved, they were happier. And so it was really fun. I call it veggie crack. For me, I felt it was a very selfish endeavor because I felt better. I was getting this dopamine hit. So I was like, yes, yeah. eat more well, vegetables. I get happy. <laughs> that's what makes it sustainable. So. And you mentioned earlier that as doctors, it's frustrating because if in a managed care environment, if you have to see a new patient every eight or 10 minutes, you don't have time to talk about what matters most. You basically go to the electronic medical record, the problem list, you listen to heart and lungs, write a prescription, they're out the door. It's not fun for doctors or patients. So we're trying to create this new paradigm. We are creating this new paradigm of lifestyle medicine. And we were able to get, after 16 years of you know, dialogue with CMS, Medicare created a new benefit category for which we're really grateful called uh, intensive cardiac rehab which covers my lifestyle program. And we've been training hospitals and clinics and physician groups and health systems throughout the country. And so instead of just having eight or 10 minutes, it's they're paying for 72 hours of training. Wow. And instead of just being the doctor, it's a whole team of people, the doctor, the nurse, the meditation teacher, the exercise physiologist, the dietitian, and the psychologist, and all work together towards a common goal. Uh, people come for four hours twice a week for nine weeks. They get an hour of supervised exercise, an hour of meditation and yoga, who would have thought Medicare would be paying for that? An hour of a support group, which is key to cre recreating that sense of community, which we can talk more about. And an hour of a group meal with a lecture. And after they finish their 72 hours, the, the nine weeks, then they continue to meet in their support group virtually using the same uh, Zoom technology that you and I are, are, are talking together now on. And it's why we're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, and better adherence than anyone's ever shown before because we're working not just at the behavior level or the informational level, but at what really motivates people to make these changes, which is pleasure and love and feeling good and meaning and purpose. And when you can help people to tap into that, and when they're suffering, there's an opportunity and a receptivity that you don't usually find that that's a kind of a window that we don't often take advantage of, then it's incredibly transformative. And I'm sure you've had patients tell you the same thing, like, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me or being diagnosed with cancer. And the first time I heard that, I said, what are you nuts? And they'd say, no, that's what it took to get my attention to begin making these lifestyle changes that have made my life so much more joyful and meaningful and fun and pleasurable and sexy and all the things that make life fun, I might not have done them otherwise. And so just like for me, getting suicidally depressed was my doorway for someone else. It could be being diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. And so that's something I'm trying to bring into medical training is to say, we have this sacred privilege as, as physicians to work with people when they're suffering, when there's an openness and receptivity to change, if we can show them how to do that in ways that, that are uh, transformative and, and sustainable. And I think it's so encouraging. My daughter's a, my oldest is a second year medical student in Texas and she didn't go to Baylor, but um, she's at Texas Tech. And what's fun is to see her have, she's already embraced these type of changes because She's seen my own practice and sharing that information and then seeing this, this new generation of physicians hopefully bring that into their everyday practice, whatever specialty they choose. And it, it's highly encouraging. Yes, I'm, I'm more optimistic now than ever. And I think lifestyle medicine is a, is, a, is, a, is a tidal wave that hasn't even begun to crest yet. And I think right. there's a convergence of forces that really finally make this the right idea at the right time. On the one hand, the limitations of drugs and surgery becoming clearer for so many chronic diseases. There are now eight randomized trials that have shown that in stable patients with stable heart disease, dense and angioplasties don't work. They don't prolong life, they don't prevent heart attacks, and they don't even reduce angina. Uh, in the case of people who have uh, early stage prostate cancer, there are two 
uh, randomized trials that showed after 10 years, men who did nothing lived as long as those who had surgery or radiation. And yet those treatments often maim guys in the most personal ways. They're often either impotent and can't have sex or incontinent and wearing a diaper for no real benefit at huge economic costs. There's only about one out of 49 or 50 men who have really aggressive prostate cancer and do benefit from these operations. And Dr. Peter Carroll, who's the chair of urology at UCSF, who I collaborated with, is one of the busiest and best urologists on the planet, but he also has the largest cohort of men who are doing what's called active surveillance, you know, what used to be called watchful waiting. So he can find the ones that really do need surgery or radiation and operate on them. But the others, instead of just saying, well, watch and wait for something bad to happen, is say, here's what you can do. There's a third alternative between doing nothing and doing treatments that, that may not help you, which is lifestyle medicine. And in the case of type 2 diabetes, as you know, getting your blood sugar down with drugs doesn't prevent the horrible complications of diabetes, you know, amputation and kidney failure and blindness and, and impotence and heart attacks and strokes nearly as well as getting it down with diet and lifestyle. So, and then the cost, you know, 86% of the $3.6 trillion we spent last year in the U.S. alone on, on, uh, on uh, what are called healthcare costs, which are really sick care costs are for treating chronic diseases that are often preventable and even reversible through changing lifestyle at a fraction of the cost. And the only side effects are good ones. So I think we're really living in a transformative time now. And it is exciting because I found that, you know, I've been practicing medicine for 16, 17 years. And that was a point I was in the active duty air force and I was seeing, I was in uh, what they call a board where we'd actually remove people from active duty because of these chronic diseases, diabetes, sleep apnea, obesity, heart disease. And it was really unfortunate because these are people who are bright and well-trained, but they had to be removed from certain activities or to be, you know, sent overseas when I was, you know, deployed overseas. You don't want someone who's maybe pinning a heart attack or has, you know, use insulin for their diabetes when you're in a very serious crisis situation. So, um, you, you, know, imagine. you know, we, we, years ago, we, we did a, we did a, we called it the pilot study because it was a study of air force fighter pilots, um, a little pun there. And yeah. as you know, um, if they just often, you know, you know, just, uh, incidentally find that they have like a 20 or 30 percent blockage in one of their coronary arteries they get grounded right. and the air force spends literally millions of dollars training fighter pilots and and there's nobody more motivated to get up in the air than a, a, a pilot that's been grounded as i don't have to tell you and so we thought well this would be great if we could show them how they could reverse it through lifestyle and they're really motivated to get back up in the air that would be a really good thing so that's just a, first of all thank you for the amazing service to to our country oh, thank you uh, Ed, um, but you can appreciate the, the, the op opportunities there as well. And I've had the opportunity to give the matriculation lecture at the U.S. Army War College the last five years until about a year ago. Uh, I never even heard of it, but as you probably know, it's in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where they train the, the elite of the elite, the future generals and Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard. And I learned um, that more soldiers are, die each year of suicide than in combat, which, you know, as I, we talked about earlier, is something that's near and dear to my heart. And, um, and so I said, you know, you've got a problem here. So I decided to, the last three lectures I gave over three years were called The Power of Love at the Army War College, which was kind of funny. Right? Um, and I figured like I have no street cred as kind of the wuss California doc talking about these things in, in, this, in this elite gathering. So the first time I asked former four-star uh, General Sam McChrystal if he would do a little video on the power of love. And he did. He said, you know, it's the most powerful thing that motivates soldiers. You know, he said, when you're on the battlefield, uh, you know, you're, you'll do anything to help the person on the left and the person on the right. And the second time I did it with, um, I asked former four-star uh, Admiral uh, Eric Olson, who was in charge of all special forces worldwide, all the Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and Delta Force and Green Berets and so on. Really a guy's guy. And he gave an amazing talk on the power of love. And he saw, he said, Love is the most powerful force. He says it crushes caution and fear, was the way he put it. Uh, you know, love for your, your, your fellow soldiers, love for your country, love for yourself, for your family. And so the same power can be harnessed in healing as well, uh, which is really what lifestyle medicine is all about. It's not just about unclogging arteries and lengthening telomeres. As important as those are, we're all going to die at some point. The question is really, how do I want to live my life? How can I live the life that's filled with the most joy and pleasure and meaning? And, and make it as fun and juicy and sexy and loving and, and intimate as we can. And then we, along with that, we find that we get healthier as well. Absolutely. And I think that's a, a nice segue back into the book because you do have those 
four tenets of move more, eat well, love more, stress less. So can you just give a little rundown in each of those segments and what that exactly means? Because all the science and everything is in here, but you and, and Anne actually do a nice job of reflecting on each of those sections together, and which I really enjoyed because you have some very good things in here. So can you give me a little bit of that, please? Sure. And Anne and I have worked together for 20 years. She's just incredibly brilliant. Uh, she developed a whole learning management system for all of the training that we're doing in the hospitals and clinics. And by the way, if people are watching this and want to know more about the, these sites that offer our program, just go to Ornish.com. Everything on there is free. Um, and also, you know, um, it's worth noting that with all this debate about what the best diet is, the only diet that's really actually been proven to reverse heart disease is a whole foods plant-based diet that's naturally low in fat and low in sugar. You know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products in their natural unrefined form. And you can eat food that's delicious and nutritious. We have, you know, 70 some odd recipes in the book. We have two weeks of commercially available foods that you can order. We don't have any financial relationship with any of them just to make it easy. And as you start to eat this way, you start to feel so much better than you want to learn how to cook and do all these things. The move more is just basically what, if you like it, you'll do it, you know. Uh, it's not like there's one kind of exercise for this, another kind for that, but there's, you know, aerobic exercise, strength training and resistance. And so some combination of all those, but I generally find that if you can incorporate it into your daily life, you're more likely to do it. I mean, I buy a portable phone, just walk around the office when you're uh, talking on the phone. I have a treadmill desk that, that I can do my email at. Um, I, um, you know, the, the studies were showing that, you know, short bursts of intense exercise, which if, if you don't have heart disease, uh, give you the same benefit as a much longer workout that's more moderate. So just run up the stairs a couple of flights, you know, really, really hard. Um, you know, I used to get uh, annoyed when I couldn't find a parking spot near the gym. I thought that's ridiculous. You know, so I park a little farther away, that sort of thing. Uh, stress less is not so much avoid stress, but rather manage it more effectively. If you just spend a few minutes a day doing some simple stretching, breathing, meditation, and so on, it makes your fuse longer. Things You can do the same work, the same family, the same environment, but you don't react in the same way. You know, People say things like, I have a, used to have a short fuse and I'd explode easily, now my fuse is longer. And love more is not just romantic love, although it certainly encompasses that, but love more in the sense of anything that creates a sense of intimacy. It can be a parent and a child, it can be an animal, it can be you know, a community member. It can be anything that brings you together with uh, these, uh, just service to the community. Anything that brings you together is really healing. And even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. You know, yoga is from the Sanskrit to yoke, to union, unite. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. And anything that really, um, you know, helps us develop compassion for ourselves and for others is healing. Anything that we wall people out, uh, you know, can lead to chronic stress and, and illness. When you start to see people as being fundamentally different from yourself, the other, then you can do bad things to them. But if they're just you in another form, and that's part of the value of meditation, not only that it helps make your fuse longer, but you know, as we talked about earlier, the ancient swamis and rabbis and priests and monks and nuns didn't develop these techniques just to unclog their arteries or get their blood pressure down, even though it can help do that. They're really powerful tools for quieting down our mind and body to experience that inner sense of peace and joy and well-being and to realize that it's always there until we disturb it. And one of the ultimate ironies of life is not being aware of that. We end up running after all these things that we talked about earlier. If only I could get all this stuff, then I'd be happy. And in the process of running after it, we, we disturb what we could have if we just stop doing that. Hmm. The other thing that happens is when you meditate and your mind quiets down, is you can get more and you can listen to your own inner wisdom, your inner voice, your still small voice within, whatever name that goes by. The voice that speaks very clearly, but very quietly. It's the one that gets drowned out by the chatter of everyday life. It's the one that wakes me up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something. <laughs> Here's an idea you haven't really thought about before. All of the studies that we've done had never been done before. People thought it was impossible, but they all were because I listened to that little voice and say, okay, let's see if we can reverse engineer a study and see if that's true or not. And also, if you take it even further, it gives you a direct experience of transcendence, that on one level, we're separate, you know, you're you and I, me. On another level, we're not. We're part of something larger that connects us. And if we can have that double vision to see, have the duality as well as the oneness, that to me is when we can be most effective and also where healing can occur at its most profound levels. And I think that is so powerful, but there's a couple of things there that I think we could even unwrap for 
quite some time talking, but sure. one thing that I found is interesting. I was listening to a, um, a different podcast and someone had mentioned, you know, they had um, interviewed one of the most wealthy individuals in the world. And what they found is that the point that they got to where they could buy anything that they wanted, they were the most lonely. Yeah. And I think it's so powerful, the statement, so that when you have someone who has the ability literally to buy, quote unquote, whatever would make them happy, they were still lacking that. So what they found is that they began to search out community in a, a religious setting or whatever. You know, that's so very, very powerful. And I, I, speak, I think it speaks volumes to what you're saying. But also this perception of stress, um, it's not just stress. You know, you talk a little bit about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, nervous systems in your book and how then actually that just that perception, but how you react to it yes. um, really makes a difference. Can you go into that just a bit? Because I think it's really powerful for people to understand that. Well, let's talk, you mentioned two things. Let me talk about the first one first, which is that I've had the, the privilege of working with some very successful people who are household names or known by one name or you know who are billionaires or whatever and they're often the loneliest and most unhappy people not always but if, it, if they're not it's despite that not because of it and the reason is is that before people at least have the myth they say oh if i could just get a million dollars or a billion dollars or be famous or whatever then i'd be happy but once you actually get that and you realize it doesn't bring you that it often can even be more isolating then it's like, at least before you had the myth to keep you going, it's now, well, now what? You know, <laughs> get really, really depressed from that, when that happens. Um, and, and, and as you say, it's not so much what we do, it's how you react to what you do. There was a wonderful study that Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who I mentioned earlier, who was at the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work with telomeres, did a study with Lisa Eppel, with women who were caregivers of either kids with autism or parents with Alzheimer's. And they found that the more stressed they were and the longer they felt stressed, the shorter their telomeres were. And when they compared the high stress and the low stress women, they found that the, there was a, a nine to 17 year shortening of their lifespan in the stressed women compared to the unstressed. But here's the good news. It wasn't um, the external environment that, that really determined that, it was the women's perception of it. And so the women, you could have two women who are very comparable life situations, but one was coping with it. They were doing all the kinds of stuff that, that we write about in our new book and undo it, and the others weren't. And that mitigated the stress so that it didn't happen that way. In fact, you know, this goes back to uh, a book that uh, was written 50 years ago called Man's Search for Meaning, uh, where they looked at concentration camp survivors in World War II. And they found that uh, you could have two people in the same bunker, and one survived and one didn't. Uh, and it wasn't the strongest and the healthiest that survived. It was often the one that had the strongest sense of meaning and purpose. Like I have to survive so that I can whatever, you know, bear witness or be reunited with my loved ones or whatever it happened to be. Right. So when we can help people realize that we can't always choose the environment we're in. It's something even as extreme as a concentration camp or taking care of a kid with autism. It's not like you can, you know, just throw them away and go, you know, something like you're stuck with them. But there's a lot that you can do to transform what could be an, a horrible situation to one that's bearable and sometimes even transformative. Right, absolutely. And I, I think it's very powerful. It's a very good book, by the way. Um, my grandmother lived with my husband and I. We've been married 26 years. And she developed a, a breast cancer, very aggressive breast cancer while she was with us while I was a third year medical student with three small children. So I was under a lot of stress. But what was always intriguing to me her perception of the situation really affected how I um, took care of her and did things. She was like, oh, I'm going to beat this. She was a totally, she had been depressed before. She had left a long-term marriage and she had come to live with us and was feeling, you know, um, loss of independence. But when she had that flip, that diagnosis, like you said, that, that life altering diagnosis really changed her outlook for life. Yeah, she almost became happier what during happened? the cancer fighting. Yeah, so she know. ended up, she beat the cancer. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was some amazing things. So when she beat the cancer, when she was in this process of chemotherapy and I'm literally shaving her hair off her, her hair, this beautiful golden mane. And then I'm sitting here going, how can she be so happy? I guess I better be happy too. <laughs> and so that's kind of how we did it. It was a family affair of how we made, you know, Grams is going to make this. And she did. Um, she you know, died many years later from nothing else but um it was a very powerful experience and i think when you see speak about children my middle child who's he'll, he's 22 jonathan he's about to finish high, uh, college you like nine when you started having kids i mean you <laughs> no that's those vegetables <laughs> there you go you yeah it's 
by the way. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm closing in on 50 next year. I'm, I'm excited about it. So um, my... Uh, myself, I look pretty good, don't you think? Yeah, you look very good. <laughs> they over 95. <laughs> I know I'm 95. You would never know it. <laughs> um, but my Jonathan, uh, he, he had really severe um, developmental disorder. And I honestly, I think it was related to, I developed hypothyroidism when I was pregnant with him. And he ended up with severe dyslexia. But we had a very very different approach to it than the majority. Um, we looked at it as a blessing and it really changed Jonathan's outlook on how he approached his own day-to-day -day challenges. And it really made a world of difference on bringing him up to par. And now he's, you know, doing great without any issues. Um, how, what gave you the wisdom to be able to do that? I'm curious. You know, I think it was, I, I couldn't ever live with the fact that my child would not have hope. And so I think it was an inner desire as a mom to give everything I could to my child. Because if I could do that, um, I've at least done everything I could. And the first thing I did was I will find a way to make this as easy for you as can and make your life good and okay. loving and wonderful. And, um, and his brother and sister really rallied around him, my husband. Um, and it, it, was, it was really powerful to see that. And he's such an amazing young man now. I have great kids and I'm really blessed, but it was it's such a bit strong, but you're exactly right. It's those experiences and those relationships that make the difference. It's not a prescription of a, you know, go do this or take this medicine. It's the power of that community and love and it is so strong. So I applaud you for bringing that to the forefront. It was really incredible. Thank you. Well, I applaud you for being such a good mom. That's incredible. <laughs> and that to me is part of the value of research is to really redefine what's possible for people. And by doing so, it can give so many people new hope and new choices. Not a false hope and not a sense of blame, but a sense of empowerment. Right. You know, we're, we're, we began the first randomized trial to see if we could reverse early stage Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there are no good drugs for treating it or for preventing it. My mom died of Alzheimer's. And so and she was a true genius. And just watching her brilliant mind decay was just so uh, painful for everyone. And, you know, when, when uh, James Watson and Watson and Crick, you know, discovered a DNA uh, structure, it was one of the first to have his uh, human genome sequence. He said, I want to know everything except that I want to know about the APOE4 gene that controls Alzheimer's, because why would I want to know if I'm at high risk of something I can't do anything about? Wow. But I think there's a lot you can do about. And so, by the way, if anyone's watching this and you live in the Bay Area uh, and you're interested in enrolling in our, our Alzheimer's study, it's all free to you. Uh, just go to Ornish.com. It's all there. But I think it's, you know, we're at a place with Alzheimer's very much we were with all these other conditions. And I'm cautiously optimistic if we can show that we can stop or reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease, it'll give millions of millions of people new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. That's why I spent so much of my time during the last 40 years doing research, because it can really redefine and therefore empower people about what's possible. Wow. And I think that's it, the word empowerment. I mean, you undo it, but you empower at the same time. So I think that's, it's amazing. And I will definitely put all the links you do. And I, I did, I, I saw that your Alzheimer's study and your link, and I'll make sure to put that because there, you know, I, what is it? Uh, it's, you, we make it to 85 in the United States, half of us will have dementia. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. scary. It doesn't have to be that way, you know. No. Uh, and, uh, again, the, it's about empowering people to make a difference. And, you know, when you lose your memories, you lose everything. And so they're it's a very motivated group of people. Right, absolutely. And, and 100%. And again, um, again, the book is called Undo It. And Dr. Ornish, if there, is there any one last little bit? Maybe there's someone who's walking that line and going, hmm, should I do it? It seems like a lot of trouble. What is that one little bit of advice that you, you've used over the uh, decades of your experience to just kind of help push people in that direction, to just give it an, a change? Because I always tell patients, I've yet to be proven wrong. wrong. Challenge me. And so, but what do you, what do you say? <laughs> well, I say, look, um, to the degree you make these changes, there's a corresponding benefit. You're gonna look better, feel better, lose weight and health, all these things. And so you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to believe me and accept enough to try it. And because these mechanisms are so dynamic, if you, the, the bigger the change you make, the more dramatically you'll feel better. And then it comes out of your own experience. And then you know, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So then you'll want to do more of this and less of that because it comes out of your own experience. And again, not out of fear of dying, which is not sustainable, but out of joy and pleasure and love and feeling that it's really are. Right. Absolutely. So if they combine both of those, avoiding the pain and then looking for the joy 
Yeah. It's a win-win. <laughs> you gain it so much more than what you give up, and that's what makes it sustainable. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Ornish, again, for your brilliant insight and your work in lifestyle medicine. It's such a joy to speak to a pioneer, someone who I now get to enjoy and reap those benefits of your hard work and hopefully generations of physicians after us. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing such awareness. Awareness is always the first step in healing and you're really doing an amazing job. So I'm grateful to be on your show. Thank you. No, thank you so much. <laughs>